Welcome, educators, parents, and scholar gamers to the Academy of Esports, episode 18. I'm an esports coach. Now what? I'm your host, James O'Hagan. This is the podcast where I delve into topics surrounding esports and education. Esports are organized competitive video games allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture, diversify opportunities for student participation, promote physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We cannot forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. So let's get started. And today is kind of an exciting day here in the state of Wisconsin in the United States. Uh, this is the first day of the new Wisconsin High School Esports Association. Last year, we had the Wisconsin High School, High School Esports Conference where uh, we did have students kind of participating, but not in a really formalized way. Uh, the participation was more along the lines of um, word of mouth and there was no oversight with the um, conference as far as having a coach or having, uh, I guess you could say, adequate representation. We had no bylaws or anything of that nature. And so over this summer, several of us from around the state that included 15 schools, schools that participated in the conference last year, got together. We worked through a basic mission and vision that we have right now in place. We worked through some basic organizational structures where we have a president and a vice president and a secretary. And uh, we also uh, worked together a set of rules, uh, what games we were going to select as being part of our conference structure. And um, I would like to say it's all been fantastic. Uh, I will say that all of the educators with which I have worked with this summer and into the fall around the Wisconsin High School Esports Association um, have been wonderful people with which to work. It's fantastic to connect with other people around the state who really feel that esports and education go hand in hand and that they are valuable. And some of the things that I've noticed um, as I have uh, been part of this, that now I'm not a coach, uh, I needed to say, I'm more one of those people, um, I'm the kind of person who is a big ideas guy. Uh, I'm the kind of guy who will go into a room and throw an idea grenade into the room, if you will, uh, a big idea, and then walk out. I'm not the person who is always necessarily interested in the details. And I know the devil is in the details, but I'm not the person who sees that. I'm more of like, give me the big picture. And then um, there's a lot of people who can come up with the smaller ideas. Not saying I don't do those things, um, especially from my days back when I was a, a network administrator. Um, everything was details. Um, so don't, please don't, don't uh, discount that. But the uh, thing that I've come across recently in conversations with not just uh, one of the people who is in our school district who is coaching uh, one of our esports teams, but um, conversation that I have seen in other places is how do I coach? And it's a very good question. And this is really an episode for people who have struggled with that idea. How do I become an esports coach? How do I coach kids in a game like Overwatch or League of Legends or Rocket League and a game that I may not really completely understand myself? A game that I've tried playing and I'm not really good at it. Don't worry. There's plenty of precedents out there where uh, the worst players of a game will make the best coaches and managers. Um, in fact, a lot of times you'll find that the better um, athletes we sell, if I'll, if I'll use an analogy, um, one of the uh, worst uh, managers ever in the history of baseball um, 
I don't want to say he was, you know, the worst. Well, he was really bad. Uh, was Ted Williams. Now, Ted Williams played for the Boston Red Sox in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, Ted Williams was a amazing, if not the best, left fielder in baseball history. Um, batted over 400 several times. I believe he's did it twice, maybe once. Was it several times? Or, I don't know. But I will say this. The problem with Ted Williams, while he was one of the most magnificent baseball players, and by the way, small fact, Ted Williams was the wingman for John Glenn, who was a NASA astronaut, um, in the Korean War. Um, Ted Williams for whatever reason, had a difficult time coaching his players because Ted, a lot of these things that Ted could do came very naturally to him. And yes, he could talk baseball and he could, for example, and when I was a child, it was known that he and Tony Gwynn, Tony Gwynn, who was a fantastic hitter for the San Diego Padres, had kind of a bond because they were both tremendous hitters. But they could speak to each other on a whole different level than than Ted Williams could speak with most baseball players. So Ted's managerial career was not as um, successful as his playing career because he would get frustrated um, because certain players just couldn't do what it was that he could do. And so it became said that, um, and I forgot which person said this, but it was said that the worst players make the best managers or the, and so I'm not saying that people who are adults right now are the worst players. Um, I do know some adults who are very good players when it comes to various games, video games, but if you have been presented with the idea of becoming a esports coach or a game club advisor or something like that and you just don't know what to do it's okay this is a very natural place um, and feeling for you to have okay so there are ways that you can think about being a coach and being somebody who leads students through this even though you are not really a good player The first thing you do have to do though is you do have to familiarize yourself with the game. So if the game that you are being asked to coach is League of Legends or Overwatch or Rocket League or even Fortnite or whatever the game may be, it is important that you get yourself in front of that game. You don't have to become uh, fantastic at it, but you should understand Um, some of the basics of that game in order to engage your students and coach them through how the game works, okay? So um, that really is the first step. Now, where are you going to go do that? Well, the good news is uh, a game like League of Legends is something you can download free of charge and to a Mac or to a PC. Uh, It does not work on a Chromebook. And you can then... um, start to familiarize yourself with the game. In fact, League of Legends has gone through and developed a new tutorial system um, to kind of take you through learning um, the game. Uh, Rocket League is a game that you could download and play on your Xbox. Overwatch is a game you can play on your PC or on your Xbox uh, or PlayStation. Um, And another place you can go to kind of familiarize yourselves with these games is either YouTube or you can also go to Twitch and you can watch people play these games and familiarize yourself with the games and how they they operate. So that's an important first step. Now you may say, okay, I've familiarized myself with uh, the game. What do I do next? How do I now um, coach esports? How do I coach these games? It's a really good question. My background is in education, um, but I was also in the Purdue marching band uh, when I was in college. And I also coached girls basketball and I coached middle school football um, in my professional career, my teaching career. And ten- and chess, actually, too. I, I, shouldn't, I should also say I coached chess. I'm a terrible chess player, okay? Perfect example, I'm a terrible chess player, 
But the way I familiarize myself with chess is I at least know the basics and I know the basic strategies. While I cannot always think several moves ahead, um, I did understand what basic strategies there were that were needed to um, at least attempt to be, and I wasn't always, less so than not, successful at chess. So for example, one of the key takeaways with chess that I always remember is the four squares at the center of the board. If you can control those four squares at the center of the board, more times than not, you will control the chess match. Um, so when I think about basketball, okay, I didn't just take a basketball and roll it out onto the basketball court and tell the girls to go play. Um, when I started coaching these girls at, in seventh grade, they had never really played organized basketball before. They had played it in a PE class, and a couple of them may have played it um, in their gym uh, uh, or at a, at a YMCA or something like that, but they had never played on a formal team for the most part. And so there was a lot of teaching that needed to take place. And it wasn't just um, teaching them how to play the game. It was teaching them how to practice because practice needed to be purposeful. I only had a limited amount of time. I only had about an hour and a half with which to work with the girls two days a week. And it was important that within that hour and a half, we did do things like practice dribbling. We did have a warm up. And that warm-up couldn't just be them going off and shooting the basketball crazy in the gym. Uh, layups needed to be practiced. Jump shots needed to be practiced. Um, Three-pointers needed to be practiced. Rebounding needed to be practiced. Um, our offense needed to be practiced. Defensive drills. Though all these things were purposefully done, to get you to a common goal. And a lot of times I didn't have enough girls to just do five on five um, live play scrimmages in the game. So I, a lot of times I only had eight girls. So I would have to do a five on three or um, I would just uh, work kids through um, with, uh, with phantom players on the court, okay? Um, football is a lot of the same way where again, you are preparing for a team usually on a weekly basis and you have to, um, break down that team and the offense that you're going to run that week and the defense that you're going to run that week to stop their offense. And you have to have a pace and a structure to your practice that isn't just going to be haphazard, but it's gotta be something that the players are comfortable with, that they respond to, that they understand. Um, an even better example that I have for this that isn't necessarily sports related goes back to actually my marching band days. So if you're a, a band director, let's say, and all of a sudden you've been asked to uh, be the esports advisor or coach or club coach, um, you may say, well, I, I do band, how do I do esports? Okay, well think about this. Uh, in the Purdue marching band, we did a show every week. And so you would have a Saturday performance. And our schedule is set up like this. Uh, on Sunday nights, the week before, uh, the Sunday before the uh, Saturday performance, um, you would get the uh, section leaders together and we would go over and watch videotape from the show of the previous week. And so we would review um, our performances and see what we needed to improve on and see where our deficiencies were and have a plan going into the next week on what we needed to do with our pregame show and our halftime show. Now our halftime shows changed week to week and our pregame shows were usually the same show but with some minor variances, okay? Monday, was typically a day that we did not go out to the practice field to um, do the show. Monday would be a day where we would practice the music for the upcoming show on Saturday, and you would get the charts, and it would allow the people in the band to look at their charts and kind of figure out where they're going to be uh, moving that week. Also, we would do things called challenges. Um, depending on certain sections, um, some sizes of sections were bigger than others. You wouldn't necessarily need all of the people, like all the trumpets, say you had 50 trumpet players, you may only need 40 of them for the show. And so you would have challenges, so you would get the 
the best 40 kids um, to march in the show for that Saturday. Um, then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you broke that show up into different parts and you practiced the different parts of that show. So you were practicing the music and there was warm up and there was a, a march from Elliott Hall of Music down to the band field and uh, we would run through the show so that you didn't just say we're going to do the whole show and everybody just go and play your songs and march through it because you couldn't do that with 400 kids um, imagine trying to coordinate 400 kids on a band field by the way um, with 400 kids you couldn't just put them out there and say go out and do the show so you had to break it up into chunks and every day it was two hours and again it was purposeful practice come friday fridays were run-throughs and so you should have by that point all the show in place so that you can do the pregame show with its uh, variances and the halftime show again with its new songs okay saturday was the the performance day so usually there was a football game that day and so what we would do is get up early in the morning go to the practice field uh, the band practice field meet there and we would actually practice the show and do a warm-up that morning and then do our game day performances which included a pregame concert at uh, slater hill we would do the pregame show we would do the halftime show and then we would march out of ross aid stadium at purdue to the fountain and do the fountain show after so as you can understand that that organization was purposeful every step of the way you couldn't there was no way you could get 400 kids coordinated if you just said go out there play your instruments here's the charts and just go out and do it okay think about that with esports while you may not understand the game completely you have a basic understanding of the game you can look at your students and try to guide them through things like what what is your what do you feel your deficiency is this week or if you're just learning the game who's going to be a top laner who's going to be a mid laner who's going to be a low a low laner and then uh, junglers um, looking at the different roles and allowing kids to um, kind of help uh, through growth mindset ideals kind of work through uh, where their deficiencies are, where their strengths are, and trying to build a team. Um, even today, uh, I had a wonderful meeting with uh, several people from the school district, and we're working on building a Racine Intramural League right now, Intramural Esports League, so that we can kind of allow students the opportunity to work in these team environments, because a lot of them know each other but they don't know each other face to face. They don't know each other um, outside of their gaming realm. And we're trying to really build uh, capacity for kids to work in these teams and to see how these teams operate and kind of get an idea of how we're gonna do this going forward. So I have involvement of several of the, of the people who want to coach esports from around the different high schools in the city of Racine. And uh, we are looking at, um, Again, allowing kids to kind of self-organize so we can get an idea because this is really new for a lot of people. So it's imagine it's, again, back to the band analogy, it's knowing that we want to have a band, but we don't know what instruments the kids can play. So this is going to allow us to see how the kids play together from our different schools, to see where are our deficiencies and where are our supports and where we can bring in and branch out to other kids in the community and to other community members to bring them in to help us kind of, of, of build this esports culture in the city. Um, one of the things I knew right away that we have to bring in into our esports culture is more females. You know, a lot of this is around changing the dynamic of what is esports culture. And uh, going back to the last episode of the podcast, in episode 17, um, I had a lot of concerns about riots gaming culture and how they're uh, addressing their system of of sexism and misogyny that they've developed from within 
And I'm very cognizant about avoiding that here in Racine. And so what we're looking to do is partnering with an organization like Girls Inc. Now we're talking about it, it hasn't been formalized yet, but working with an organization like Girls Inc. to um, guide us and to help recruit um, girls who want to have an esports experience and want to be gamers. Because that's the way we start to change the culture and the dynamic and the stereotype about what a gamer is. We need to connect all of our students into this entire um, esports world um, and give them the opportunity to participate in this esports world. And by not focusing so much on the game itself, but on building the, the community around it, now we're starting to build those collegiate and career pathways for kids. We're starting to help them um, develop those uh, social connections that will help with pushing against adverse childhood experiences and promoting better physical and mental health. Um, we're talking about redefining what is athletic culture um, in the city of Racine. That's giving kids an opportunity to be participants in something more than just playing the video games in their basement, but in something greater. So um, for those of you, again, who are uh, new to esports um, and are thinking about being a coach and are worried, do I really know enough? Ask yourself this, if you're an educator, you know, um, how do you teach kids in your class? Do you just say, here's the math book and you let, let them go? Or how do you teach kids to read? Do you just give them a book and say, just read this? No, you don't. Your way you teach your class, hopefully, is that you have a purposeful practice built in, that you are doing things to promote good scholar gamers, well, excuse me, with your, with your students, good uh, scholastic behaviors, I should say. Um, and then um, you're, you're starting to refine and redefine uh, what it is for your students and personalize the instruction down to what their needs are. It's almost the same thing. The thing that scares a lot of people is it's a medium that they're not used to and it's a game they don't necessarily know. So again, get yourself familiar with the game. Think about what purposeful practice would look like. And then if you needed to, like I said earlier, develop a system of intramurals or um, get your feet wet with a gaming club where you can kind of start to learn um, what kids are good at, what games they are playing, and getting an idea and a sense of what your gaming culture currently looks like and where you would need to make adjustments to better the gaming culture that you have in your schools. So that will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. You may follow me on Twitter, at Jim O'Hagan, that's at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N, and through the Academy of Esports account at T-A-O Esports. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at www.facebook.com slash TAO Esports. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.